Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining today's talk on containing security when working with containers. My name is Adrian Gonzalez and I'm a principal software engineering lead here at Microsoft. As part of my role, I am accountable for ensuring that security is part of my team's engineering fundamentals and incorporate as all as part of all outputs, whether it's working with a customer or working on a product. Outside of work, I enjoy experiencing new cuisines, going on wine tastings, traveling the world, most outdoor activities, and playing and watching baseball. Throughout the presentation today, we're going to cover the four phases that I've experienced when working with security around containers. First, we're going to explore the top quadrant here, which is around creating, updating container images. In this section, we're going to cover four topics and outline some examples as well as uh, additional details around what are some of the, these best practices when creating and updating container images. The first practice I want to talk about is making sure that you have uh, that you're running the latest uh, versions or most re re relatively recent versions of the OS and as well as the container uh, environment. In this image and in the future slides, I'm going to be using Docker as an example. Typically, the steps to perform this will vary. Uh, the syntax will vary based on your operating system and tool of choice, but the typical steps include things like uninstalling old versions, updating any packages that are required to perform the commands on the CLI, adding GPG keys to ensure security when downloading dependencies, setting up repositories to be able to store where the downloads will, will, will take place, and then ultimately determining what version of either the OS or the container framework you're using. Uh, so in this case, it would be uh, you know a particular version of Docker Engine, Container, and Docker Compose. And in this images here, you see how I outline the command that I use to determine what are the recent versions of Docker, as well as what version I want to use for my uh, dependencies. The next best practice is ensuring to use non-root users. And in this particular case, uh, you'll see examples both in the top left and top right images where I define a particular username, I give it a user ID, and I create uh, a particular group for that user to be associated with. And you'll see a command highlighted there where I just want to share that in my experience, it's okay to have certain non-root users be able to perform pseudo operations, but you do want to limit what, how many users and also definitely segment the users potentially as separate groups as well. The last uh, line in the top left image is that effective uh, use of ensuring that when the container runs, it's using that username and not a root user. The bottom right image is effectively the same structure, uh, but using a real example of where I needed to download a Golang base image uh, from Docker containers. Um, and then I had to actually go back and use the root user to install uh, some dependencies. In this case, I removed most of those dependencies and just showed the run command where I would update dependencies. And then once I finished that uh, custom tailoring of my image, I completed the Docker file by switching back to that non-root user. Another best practice is making sure to use trusted sources or trusted registries. Here in this image, we show I show how the what is the relationship between a registry, an image, and a container, where registries is effectively nothing more than a uh, repository of images. Images are static representations of running uh, containers, and then a container is the actual instance that is running. And you'll see that when working with Docker, it follows that same convention when uh, you see indications of the from command, where the first piece of that from command is a registry, followed by a slash, followed by the repository name, as well as the image name, and then followed by a colon and the specific version of that image. Now, when using trusted sources and registries, know that that can be both on-prem as well as public cloud through other providers, whether that be um, Azure, AWS, Google, uh, some other cloud or JFrog Artifactory. Another best practice is making sure that when defining images that they are as lean as possible. That typically translates to only install the dependencies that that container requires to perform its function. But it also uh, includes another mindset that I outline in the top left image, 
which is separating build versus runtime dependencies. In this image, we're installing what looks to be some kind of a node application, or we want to create some kind of a node application uh, that is a web app. And so the first part that I highlight here is all the steps required to build that solution. And that's performed by running that run yarn run build command. Uh, and of course, I had to uh, install yarn to do that. As you can see, yarn install, uh, or sorry, install all the node NPM packages to do that. And depending on the solution, those can get quite hefty and include a lot of dependencies. Now, the second piece that I highlight is a totally different Docker um, base image called Nginx Alpine. And here I'm copying only the outputs of the run build command in the previous step and storing them in this new base image. And now I no longer have to worry about all the other NPM packages that were required to actually build a solution. And my image is now leaner has less dependencies and is uh, therefore less prone for vulnerabilities. Uh, also in the bottom right example is another uh, extension of how I was able to extend um, a Golang image and a Python based image. And uh, again, I removed all the custom dependencies I had to install for keeping this brief, but um, you see how I start using the inline 10, the Golang image, I download it. And then in line 12, I download the Python image. I would perform my custom dependencies and install them there. And then in line 18, all I do is copy everything from the Golang base image into my current working image. And that is what I would ultimately produce. The next phase in our cycle here is securing that container registry. I want to talk about a few concepts as outlined in this slide. First stop is around using, considering what is a, using and what is a private registry. Well, really a private registry is nothing more than just a regular public registry, but it is segmented by having um, stronger network security policies in place. Now, these can be things like firewalls, source IP range policies, or poor policies. The importance here is uh, security by uh, not even knowing that a registry exists and only granting individuals, or in this case, uh, networks, uh, the ability to connect to your registry on a need to know basis. Another important concept when working with registries and securing a registry is affiliating a concept called digital signatures to that registry. I provide a couple definitions on what that is here. To keep it brief, a digital signature really is nothing more than what it sounds like. It's a digital signature that creates trust and a chain of custody of any image or any version of an image uh, that is available for you to consume. It gives you that additional sense of confidence that that image um, is produced by whoever said produced it and gives them uh, gives you that sense of accountability that you know who to hold uh, and reach out to if there were any uh, issues with that image. And the three images I have here, I show how I use Docker to first create a digital signature key. Docker trust key generate I'm not Jeff, but I would replace that with my name. Um, the second image, I add that key that was just generated. And I, it's important to note that prior to generating the key, I do have to provide that password to be able to generate the private key. But once I set my password and I have the private key, I would affiliate that key to the registry. That's what the middle image command is performing. And you can see it's saying that it's adding Jeff to the registry and it is prompting for that password so that it can successfully do so. In the bottom image, we're effectively running um, the command to publish that image to that registry. And you can see the command Docker trust sign, the name of the reposit, uh, the name of the registry, the repository is called admin and the image name is called demo and it's version one. And again, I'm going to be asked for my password. Once I enter my password, that published Docker image in that registry will now be digitally signed by myself. And any consumer can get that information that I was the one that signed it at a particular point in time. Another best practice is around identity access management, IDEM, and role-based access management. To start, let's define two important terms here. A role is nothing more than a unique ID, uh, a set of a unique ID, set of permissions, and what assets or assets uh, those permissions are being granted to for that role. 
an account is a set of uh, ID and roles. And that account I'm visually representing as keys uh, in, in this image. In the bottom left image, you can see how the service Azure Container Registry, which is Azure's registry uh, solution, has a total of six or seven different roles, and each role out has different sets of permissions. Now, one best practice to consider here is always consider uh, minimizing highly privileged accounts and only grant permissions that are required per each account, minimal privileges. And so in this example, um, the least privileged would be a key to my image that may only contain, say, the ability to download that image. Um, so that would be the ACR pool command. Um, another more highly elevated privileged key would be the one on the far right, which is assigned to the My Helm chart and the base slash node repository. And that one, let's say for a sake of argument, is given the ability uh, the role contributor. So that whoever has that key can then perform all of these permissions and operations that are outlined in the left image. And the most highly privileged key is the one that is affiliated at the registry level. Even if it's the ability to just do, say, pool of images for all repositories and within that image, within that repository, I still consider that a highly privileged account and should be um, highly secured and restricted in terms of who can use it. The next phase is around container DevSecOps operations. And again, we're going to cover a few topics here from ensuring that the CI agent can have access to the registry to what is container scanning and the various CI stages. So first, when working with CI pipelines and container registries, it's important to first make sure that your CI solution, and in this case, in the image, I use Azure DevOps, has the ability to connect um, via the network to that container registry. That may involve making some security network changes on the firewall or uh, security policies. Second is to uh, consider creating as many account keys for different teams or individuals that will be using the CI pipeline platform solution. And the same mindset that we did before applies where we want to be as granular as possible. The most common account key I create in my experience is CI agent number three. Uh, so for each account, only have maybe one or the minimal number of repositories and only granting that account ACR pool permissions. A little more elevated permission might be the CI agent number two key, which has, in this case, visually two repositories um, that grant that key holder, contributor, and ACR image signer permissions. This is great for a pipeline that will be doing pushes to those repositories. That way the pipeline can digitally sign those images and consumers know which pipeline or which team that uses that pipeline produced said images. And again, the most highly privileged key is CI agent number one. Uh, this would be very limited, especially on a CI level. So um, you know, definitely very cautious to have a CI have this account key um, Perform because as owner, it could, uh, it has complete control over that entire registry and all its underlying repositories. But it may be useful for a DevSecOps team to perform to fully automate the provisioning and main management of future repositories. Next is talking about the CI stages involving containers and DevSecOps. We're going to go through each step here shortly, but just like all CI pipelines, everything is based on a container code change or code commit specifically those that maybe pertain to the uh, container definition like the image uh, or Docker file in this case. Step one, build. Don't worry about the syntax from here on out. This is Azure DevOps. And what I wanna make sure is that we focus more on the actual Docker commands or the tools that I'm using uh, that I'm working through, that I'm gonna be showing you all. So in this case, the build, this step is relatively very simple. It's just running Docker build with a particular tag using the image name variable that would be passed in as part of CI pipeline. Uh, it would be putting in all build arguments that we'd be putting in as part of the Docker build process. And then a parameter called Docker file name that tells uh, what the file Docker file name is for Docker to look and build the container image from. Step two is running tests. Think of this as unit tests for your container. 
The first thing I highlight here is a CLI command that you may not be familiar with called tox. Uh, and then, you know, the rest of that command, dash E, test infra, make target environment. That's basically just a way to distinguish whether the container is suited for dev or all the way up to production. Uh, and then the parameter for image name as before. Uh, before we get into what Tox is, I also want to talk about the second task in this image, which is only triggered when the previous task succeeds. And if it does succeed, you can see that what we do is we effectively echo, uh, and in this particular case, what we're really doing is we're just sending a variable called test past and giving it the value of true that we will be using in further steps of the CI pipeline. So what is Tox? Uh, Tox is a virtual environment management and test CLI that relies on PyTest, which is a Python package, to effectively uh, run Python code that is comprised of uh, methods that are test cases, and each test case has assertions. Let's show an example of what one of those looks like. Here is one very rudimentary example of uh, what a file will look like. And you can see, like I described, each method starts with the def syntax. Um, and then you know, we pass in variables like host, like file content. And then inside of the method, we perform the actual assertions. So the first method tests to see that certain files exist in the container, uh, the running container instance. The second test, test container running, checks to see if the user uh, that is has an active session in that container is root. Note, we just talked that we don't want to run, uh, that we want to run containers as non-root. So I would argue that this assertion should be changed to say process.user is not equal to root. So we give more freedom in our test case assertions that other users are allowed, but root is not. And then other assertions include things like testing certain properties on what the host system is, checking to see environment variables that are set, ports that are exposed, or sockets that the container may be listening on. Again, this is just a set place to get started. Uh, definitely encourage folks to look into additional assertions that make sense to test uh, to ensure that the container is properly configured and defined. Next up is around scanning for vulnerabilities at the container level. In this example, I use a software uh, solution called Trivi. And you can see uh, first step is for me to download and install Trivi. And all I'm doing here is making an HTTP request to uh, install the DBM package and <clears throat> ensure that Trivi got successfully installed. The second task is where things get interesting. I'm running two scans using Trivi. The first scan in the uh, first portion of the line there in the script is effectively telling Trivi to pass the pipeline even if it finds vulnerabilities with severity low and medium when targeting a particular image repository and a particular image tag version. The second scan, however, will fail the pipeline if the severity, if it detects any severities at the high or critical level. Again, this is subject to risk tolerance based on the industry and the team and the particular solution on our development, but I definitely uh, would encourage individuals to side on the air of caution and ensure that there are no high nor critical vulnerabilities in the container dependencies. Here's an example of what a test uh, vulnerability report from Preview looks like. Uh, I've highlighted the key things just to keep an eye on. You'll see the total number of vulnerabilities and their classifications. And then at the bottom, you see a table with really rich information around what's the dependency or library, specific vulnerability ID, its severity, the installed version that it was found, and then Trivi actually goes and searches its data sets, its database to see what is the fixed version where that vulnerability is no longer in place, further empowering you and the team to decide how to fix the vulnerabilities. Here are more example scanning tools that I encourage you to look into. That includes Aqua, SonarCube, WhiteSource. So the next step is around versioning and publishing the image. Now, I'm gonna break this down to by first saying there's two parts to this. In my experience, it's worthwhile to publish even the images that failed previous tests. And the reason for that is it makes it easier for a subset of consumers to download those failed images and troubleshoot them, patch them, fix them, and then publish the code changes that fixed it to the true repository. Now, the caveat here is 
just like how we talked about many different keys, that needs to be uh, a different key that grants a unique repository in that registry called, you know, effectively failed um, with some form of like a failed syntax or indicator. That's what we're doing in the first highlighted section of this image. We're effectively, you know, on a test passed variable value being set to false, which would happen if the vulnerability scan or if the talks test failed, we would set that to false. Now we will run a script to create a tag for that image and append at the very end of it the dash failed value as seen at, near the top of the image. After we've tagged that image appropriately, the failed image, we now publish that image. And again, the condition here in ASDO, that syntax is effectively the same as before. And all we're doing here is pushing it to the proper repository uh, with the proper suffix. Now, what's key here is just, I, I want to call out for you the CI credentials that's being used to authenticate the CI pipeline with the registry is in Azure DevOps found using this parameter called service connection. Uh, just wanted to mention that it's specific to Azure DevOps, but just want to make sure that we are still doing this securely for all these examples. The continuation is now to also publish the happy path. If an image passed all the way through, we want to make sure that we tag that image appropriately. And you can see that that's taken place in the first task at the top. And we're using a value called latest to give it a name called latest for that version. The middle task is effectively uh, pushing the Docker image, but using a parameter image tag instead of the value latest. Uh, here you can decide to use the conventions such as major dot minor dot minor minor, or use a convention that maps the CI build GUID uh, or job ID to that image as well. Uh, I've seen both options work pretty well in my experience. The bottom task publishes the same image, but now publish it uses using the latest tag or the latest version label. Now I caution to use this just because it is prone to more convenience, but it's also prone to having less control over how large the impact is if that Docker image did in fact contain a vulnerability that just sneaked through, that was missed. Uh, because if latest is available, consumers will typically opt to do uh, con convenience and use latest. And you may find that you have a lot wider number of users that may be impacted if you were to push a vulnerability to latest versus pushing it to a very specific uh, version as is done in the middle task. The next phase and last phase in our cycle is around best practices when securing the production environment that uses containers. The first best practice I want to share is the concept around network segmentation. Uh, specifically, uh, in your own time, I encourage to read up on a concept called nano segmentation. When working with containers, just like with any other infrastructure, it can be pretty segmented and locked down to have security policies that limit who can connect to it, as well as limit what other infrastructure that component can connect to. So with containers, we're going to do the same thing. We want to wrap containers around a subnet or even, you know, even be more nano about it and wrap individual containers within uh, multiple subnets uh, so that it's further segmented and have pretty strict policies in place to limit uh, what can connect to it uh, and what the container subnets can connect to. Again, this is great to minimize the potential impact radius if there was, in fact, a vulnerability that uh, was exploited with that infrastructure or that container. Next up is a great preventative measure to prevent denial of service or a uh, depletion of container resources, and that is setting resource quotas. By default, containers have no resource constraints. So if a running container was hijacked and for some reason it started really consuming all the CPU memory or other infrastructure resource, it could bring, uh, it could deplete all of it. So the example I show here is how we can use Kubernetes. Um, the same can be done with Docker as well, but in my example here, I show how I do it with Kubernetes to limit um, at each either namespace or at the container level, uh, what is the default number of CPU and memory allocated to each container. 
and what is the maximum that can be granted to that container. Another best practice is around continuing, continuous container monitoring. There's three pieces to that, environment hardening, vulnerability assessment, and runtime threat protection for nodes and cluster. Environment hardening is effectively any solution that performs container monitoring, such as Azure Microsoft Defender for Container, should contain, should provide these three solutions. Environment hardening checks to see if there's any misconfigurations or configurations that are not secure. For example, if there are no resource quotas, Microsoft Defender would flag that as a vulnerability in its continuous monitoring. Um, vulnerability assessments performs the same thing we did earlier in our CI pipeline and just scans for vulnerabilities in container image dependencies. But why do we will need to do that again and continuously? Well, the reason for that is vulnerabilities can come up at any point in time in the future. Not all vulnerabilities are known from the get-go. So as you have images that pass vulnerability scans and now they're in the registry and they have running instances or solutions from those images, you want the ability for a platform to be able to continuously run vulnerability scans and map any vulnerabilities to actively running uh, containers so that you as a team can determine how to best mitigate and minimize the chances of security um, issues. And then the last piece is runtime threat protection, which ultimately will scan the behavior of each running container and just raise any anomalies. Uh, whether it's the container doing a highly privileged operation like user management at the uh, you know cloud level or at the Active Directory level, or whether it's uh, the con uh, the container performing a highly privileged operation against some other core in piece of infrastructure that it supposedly typically has not done before. So any deviations in behavior would also be flagged. In this slide, I encourage you to look up uh, what Azure's container uh, protector tool offers and uh, what it checks against. And the particular link that you'll be able to look in your own time is Center for Threat Informed Defense, teaming up with Microsoft to really build the notion of attack, uh, the, the attack container matrix that outlines all of these different checks that are performed by these tools as part of runtime uh, threat detection. Here, I wanted to provide a sample uh, vulnerability assessment provided by uh, the Azure Container Defender solution. And you'll see, as I highlighted here, it does surface certain uh, infrastructure misconfigurations. It surfaces uh, things like active uh, container image with running instances that had vulnerabilities installed, uh, and then also checks for Kubernetes to see that it has uh, certain Azure policies enabled for further protection. A couple of resources uh, I also want to share here. Uh, the top right or top left QR is Microsoft's commercial software engineering playbook. Uh, as it states in the slide, this is a collection of fundamentals, frameworks, just general best practices and examples that both myself and uh, many other individuals have contributed to over the years. Uh, it's open sourced, so uh, we continue uh, updating this as uh, better practices or new best practices are surfaced. And then the bottom left or bottom right QR code is our open source for dev containers. I really like to share this out because it offers a great starting place on what good practice, uh, well-defined Docker images look like. Uh, dev containers are a little more specific in nature as that allows VS Code to run within a containerized environment, but that's another story for another day. Uh, great resource just to look at best practices on Docker container or container image definitions. And that wraps up our entire life cycle. Uh, if anything, I really want to share five key takeaways. One is make sure that the entire team has awareness on container DevSecOps practices. Uh, it's going to make them feel more bought in, more informed and educated versus making it seem like it's just a lot more requirements and work that is being brought down to the team. Second, enforce RBAC policies uh, to prevent individuals from disabling control gates at the CI pipeline level. Um, this is tends to be something that's overlooked in my experience. And it is a vulnerability where if a developer or a team is in really, you know, in a rush mode, they might want to disable certain control gates that are there for a good reason. So uh, really limit who can manage those control gates um, and limit uh, individuals that can perform those operations. 
Third, uh, hold all members of the team accountable for adhering to secure container management and make sure that they know that they can hold each other accountable as well. Uh, after all, security is a team effort uh, and uh, everyone is, uh, you know, is responsible for raising issues and or concerns. For this, uh, depending on uh, the level of maturity around DevSecOps uh, that you are uh, experienced with or working in, uh, there may be need to influence change. And like all things uh, you know, that require influencing, it's most effective when done as a community and when uh, individuals connect business, uh, the business mission and the business success criteria to these principles of security as well. And last but not least, it's probably one of my favorites. Um, decisions are all about ratios between convenience and security. And there is no servile bullet. Um, everything needs to be custom tailored to based on industry, based on solution, uh, based on who the consumers are. But one of the key things that I've learned in, the, uh, in my experiences, especially when starting off at the beginning, weigh security heavier. Uh, and over time, you'll find that it's less costly and easier to shift the balances to find the right ratio between convenience and security. Uh, and the reason it's less costly is because if we were to shift that and weight convenience heavier over security at the beginning, uh, that is setting up a potential for a vulnerability to be exploited and for there to be a data breach or some other type of attack. And with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking you all for attending and wish everyone uh, continue having a safe uh, rest of the calendar year. And in case you know we don't get to touch base later, uh, wish everyone a happy uh, new year in 2023. Thank you.